You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Used to be when you took a picture, the final product was a print. If you took pictures and didn't have a home darkroom, you knew somebody who did, or at the very least, you had a cordial relationship with your local camera shop or photo mat. Remember photo mats? That may not be the case anymore, but there are a lot of shooters out there who still appreciate the tactile and visual aspects of well-executed prints. The good news is that there are a number of very able and very affordable options for outputting prints in your home or studio. Or if that's not your cup of tea, there are service bureaus and print labs that can tackle everything from standard print sizes to full-blown mural installations. Today, John Harris, myself, and our guests, Sam Celebri and Jay Tannen, will be talking about digital printing in all its forms, including photo quality inkjet printers, print media, and ink sets, as well as going over the different options you have when you take your final image file to a digital print service. But before we begin, a request from all of us to all of you, our listeners. If you enjoy listening to our show, take a moment and leave us a review on iTunes. And if you're not already a subscriber, do so. Subscribe. It's free. We don't charge. Also, big news. We have a new landing page for our podcast on the B&H website. It has all of our back catalog, along with images from our guests. We're still putting the final touches on it, so please visit it and give us your feedback. Check bhphoto.com slash explorer slash podcast. Okay, we're going to be starting off today's show with Al's Gearhead Pick of the Week. And this week, the lucky winner is the Wine Country Camera 100 millimeter filter holder. It's pretty exotic. It's made out of aluminum alloy with rosewood side grips. Kind of looks like a filter holder designed by a Southern California surfboard shop. It's well designed. It's if anything, it's over designed, uh, but it performs the way it's supposed to. It accepts 100 by 100 millimeter and 100 by 150 millimeter filters up to two millimeters thick. It's got smooth push button controls and even has gears made out of alloy and rosewood. Polarizing filter mount internally and can be easily rotated by thumb gears. It's available with a choice of options with adapters for all standard filtered thread sizes from 49 through 86 millimeter. And as they say at the Wine Country Camera Shop, shoot now, drink later. There you have it. Anyway, Let's get started with today's show. If you have shopped for printers or printing supplies at our New York City Superstore, there's a good chance you've had the pleasure of needing and possibly even getting some solid advice from printer guru meister Sam Celebrity. I know a thing or two about printers, and I take Sam's thoughts on the subject seriously. Was that good? How's that for an intro? Yeah, it was great. It was great. Okay. Energy pack. I love it. I I copyrighted (laughs) that, so forget about it. We're also very fortunate to be joined today by Jay Tan, and Jay is former formerly of the famed New York City lab Dugal, and he's also a photographer in his own right, as attested by his recent images of Cuba, which I've been following on Instagram. Jay will share with us some insights on what your best options are if you're going to be using a print lab, or as they call them sometimes, service bureau. Do you want a DISA print, a digital C print, or an inkjet print? And Sam will fill us in on what our best options are if you plan to buy your own printer. Let's start with Jay and Sam jump in as you want. Um, Jay, give us a background about the types of prints they are and how they would basically compare. You know, people think a color print is a color print, but there's a lot of options on that. So give us a quick little history of when we went from analog and where we are in digital and how they compare. All right. Um, I guess let's start back. You had initially dark room, dark room where you're using an optical enlarger, printing black and white, printing color. Mm-hmm. Along came digital, and basically you had a digital enlarger, which basically used a laser to project the image onto photographic paper. Initially, it was actually the same color paper that was used in an, with an enlarger. Uh, later on, it would change to be optimized for that type of light source. Mm-hmm. Uh, the big advantage was that if you were using optics, you never got totally pure color. You would have fall off depending on the quality of the optics. With laser, uh, 
printing, you can literally print something uh, as large as you want, just an 18% gray, and it will be total solid with no defects or changes in color. Mm -hmm, so you mm -hmm. have greater, greater control. And I think that's the major thing. Uh, again, with conventional darkroom, if you were burning and dodging, let's say by hand, I mean, you had... Uh, uh, issues uh, with digital using uh, making your changes in uh, Lightroom or Photoshop, you have greater control. And repeatability. Yeah. And when Inkjet came along, uh, that was, I guess, around uh, approximately 2000, you know, Epson put together a great roadshow, great images. It got photographers very excited because now you could make your own prints, control your own prints. A cost factor was, was, was certainly there, and people got extremely excited. Plus, you have the archival aspect. Photographic prints, even though uh, you're saying Fuji... Uh, photographic paper might be uh, archival. I mean, it's really not. The life, uh, depending on sunlight, ultraviolet light, could be five years, ten years, and then you'll see noticeable fading. Inkjet, depending on the combination of the types of inks, pigmented ink being the best type of paper, you will have much, much longer longevity before you notice any discoloration or fading. You could get into hundreds of years. You know, but that's, that's something important, I think, to yeah. note is that when people talk about, uh, when professionals talk about mm. life expectancy, when they say a print will have a life of, say, 25 years, mm. they're not saying that it's going to be vanished. It's just going to be a blank piece of paper. They say, 25 years is when you start noticing shifts in color, contrast, tonality, noticeable changes to it. It, it depends, you know, how critically you're looking at the image. I've had images that I've seen every day, and after about six years or so, I could start to see changes. At the same token, I would say this, and I think uh, even so many great prints that have been produced on photographic paper, color, uh -huh. um, I've seen prints in galleries and shows, and I know looking at these prints, there's only a matter of years before th that image is just going to fall, you know, be lost. I mean, it's a harsh reality where inkjet, you have a greater permanence, a greater lifespan before you're going to notice anything. Um, so I think that's an issue. I think also the advantages of inkjet certainly is you have a much wider color gambit, you know, many colors that you uh, will not be able to see in a photographic C print. You can see in an inkjet print. You have a greater choice of papers. I was just going to come to that. Yep. It used to be that a okay, C print is a C print is a C print. But now you see inkjet, which printer is it? What media is it, are you using? And there's a lot of little variations there's, you can do there now. There, there's, there's a tremendous amount of variables because when inkjet first came out, it was trying to kind of mimic the look of C print. Right. Then it was starting to use fine art paper, canvases, other, other mediums. Then eventually you progress where you have flatbed printers, printing on wood, printing on metal. I mean, you have so many different technologies that have grown out of what started as a basic inkjet. Mm -hmm. can, can, we, can I ask what the difference is, if there is, between what we call the C-print and now what's called the digital C-print? Well, it's just how it's produced. The initial C-print was done in a, with an enlarger, right. you know, an optical enlarger. When digital C-prints, which again, using a, usually a laser was the first technology, it was the same paper. After time, that paper is changed mm -hmm. to maximize the quality using a laser as opposed to a conventional and larger light source. A better match. Yeah. And even with um, digital enlargers, you basically have several manufacturers. Uh, they work slightly different. Also, you have different resolutions, mm -hmm. which is another factor right. yeah. because um, the same image printed on different Enlargers, digital enlargers, will look somewhat different. Depends how critical you're looking it's at. It's the same it. thing with cameras. Every every digital camera has a slightly different yep. look. Yeah, you could I, tell a Fuji camera picture. You, you, you <laughs> have that. You also, I mean, variations maybe in your processing. You know, different. Uh, you know, you know, so in lines. general, if someone is going out and. We're, we're not necessarily talking a professional image yeah. or something for a gallery, but uh, something that somebody wants to make that's nice, they're going to put in a frame, put it on their mantle. The options that are available for them right now are what? And, and from what I understand, you have you still have die sub, which maybe you can explain in detail. You have digital C print and you have inkjet. Is that the three major choices? Basically, yeah. I mean, with, with 
photographic because uh, when it comes down to it, I mean, even with, with from a cost standpoint, for a, a company to produce photographic prints, you need a digital enlarger. Mm -hmm. You're talking, you know, I mean, quite a bit of dollars. You need processors, you know, quite a bit of dollars, chemistry and so forth. So it's a, it's a fairly large investment. Um, the advantage is that if they're going to do, let's say, quantities, somebody wants a thousand, it's probably going to be faster, more economical to do it in that method, Which that method? technology. Uh, Which method is that? Well, a photographic. Oh, okay. You know, right. you know photographic. Right. So right. it depends on the type of organization uh, you might be going to. I mean, the one thing is a photographic lab in most cases will usually have greater options. I think the best thing is if someone wants to have a print on, they go in and most organizations will have the same image printed in different methods. You can see the difference. You might like this, the same way photographic, is it on a matte paper, gloss paper, metallic paper, uh, you know, trans material, different looks. And those looks will you know, affect uh, what, what, what you think. When it comes to uh, inkjet, again, you have you know, so many different papers. Uh, most people are not concerned what type of inkjet printing. I mean, basically with inkjet, you know, you have dye base, you have pigmented. Pigmented is certainly, you know, much more, you know, you know the archival aspect and uh, used much, much more. Some places are still using, uh, you know, dye because it's uh, much more economic and it's usually, uh, you know, faster as well. What's a quick difference of between dye and pigment? You know, some... Dye is like uh, water. Mm -hmm. Pigment is like milk. When it dries, dye, there's nothing there. Milk, you have a powder. Okay. So that's, you know, what's your, yeah. uh, you know, lasting factor. There's actually a hard, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. surface. Which it's, is more, it simple. holds up to UV and everything else better. Mm -hmm. Dyes yeah. just get wiped yeah. away. It, is there a big, early on, I know yeah. there was a big difference between dye-based inks for inkjet and the pigment. Yeah. Pigment was almost like a, a pastel. It had no, yeah. no, no density to it, no saturation. Is it kind of an even playing field now between a good dye and a good pigment-based I I personally, I mean, have really stayed with, uh, the, you know, the pigmented, because with, with dye, you never know about your life. Oh, yeah, the early ones were uh, terrible. I, I, they I, looked good for the first three weeks, well, and then that was it. Well, the, the, the first prints, I mean, iris prints going way back, yeah. iris prints were really a proofing method to produce an image from a digital file to see what it was going to look like. They look beautiful. In some cases, they would last weeks, months, and then just f fade out. And But the concept of that is what started, you know, Nash editions and really the whole inkjet area kind of, you know, took off. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sorry. actually, I just want to jump back yeah. to one thing we're yeah. talking about with, with C prints and digital okay. C print. A conventional C print is a, a photographic dye based uh, print. It's photo dyes. It's, yeah. A digital C print. It's, it's, it, no, the, the, let's go back there. That's where I it's want to simply, clear. It's simply how the image is put on the paper. Ah, uh, okay. It, you can basically use exactly the same paper. One, you're putting the image on optically through an enlarger. One, you're putting the image on using a laser. So it's like wet it chemical It goes process. through the same, uh, same okay. chemistry. Uh -huh. It goes through the same chemistry. The paper currently, that's, you know, for, because almost no one is really doing optical, let's say. Mm -hmm. Most people are, you know, doing uh, laser. The paper has been optimized for that light source. But the paper itself, the chemistry it goes through. That's all the yeah. same. Okay, gotcha. So the two paper media types that were used a lot was the Kodak, Endura, and Fujifilm Crystal. Crystal on, Archive. Right, mm -hmm. right, on the digital C prints. Yeah, uh, I mean, Acfamate paper, um, and then you had uh, other, you, know, you had gloss, matte, um, flex material, Duratran, uh, clear. I mean, you, you did right, have you know, right. different media. Uh, because most of things initially going back in the history were done really for commercial aspect, you know, store display, let's say, right, you yeah. know, trade shows, point of purchase. And then obviously once photographers, uh, you know, got involved with the whole thing, it's uh, I mean, even using, 15, 20 years ago, yeah. I, I knew that people, artists or photographers who would uh, uh, do it for art galleries and museum because it was professional and they liked the output out of that. It was one of the best outputs during that time. Yeah. And now with 
pigmented base machines taken over, mm -hmm. like with Epson and Canon printers out in the market. Uh, people have the experimentation of not only resin coated, but matte coated, cotton rag, fine art papers, fiber based mm -hmm. paper, brighter paper, you name it. And now it's giving the element of control where you don't have to deal with hazardous materials in like dark room or have to buy an expensive unit like the light jet models or the lamina models mm -hmm. were hundreds of thousands of dollars. Correct. Now you could get a 24 inch wide format, 44 inch wide format around 2,600, 3,000, or even $5,000. And it's museum quality oh, it's out there. It's museum quality. Yeah. It's, it's amazing yeah. what level we have come through right now where not only a photo enthusiast, but a fine artist, graphic artist, illustrator, you name it. You could put your work out there and it's museum quality and um, people sell their prints. And it's, it's amazing how people experiment with these machines and experiment with paper where you could see outstanding work of, of these large prints. And, and it, it has become professional, semi-professional and consumer level to a point that if people have a great eye and understanding of printing, uh, you could put your work out there. Mm -hmm. And amaze people, and mm -hmm. it's it's amazing that you know we sell these products for making it convenient for people to you know express their their form of art. No, yeah, like you don't have to have a separate part of the home, right? That's <laughs> separate from everybody else. You don't have to take over the ba basement or bathroom, or, or take over the bathroom <laughs> and lock people out for a few hours. All the I machines mean, are big; <laughs> it will take up space. Yeah, but <laughs> the thing is, you can do it also in daylight. You're no longer right. trapped into this right. dark chamber. Right. Okay, so it's it socially works out a lot better. So I'm sorry, can I jump back to uh, what's available for the consumer to outside of the home? You wanna you wanna go to to a lab, and you're often given the choice between digital C print and inkjet, and there's a price difference. Inkjet's usually a little more expensive, um, but is there a reason to go to the inkjet level if let's say you just want to have a print for your home? Or is the digital C print gonna? What's the disadvantage and what's I, the advantage? I I think it's really. You know, the look mm -hmm. is, is different. Mm -hmm. And I think um, someone should just try to see some samples of the same image, different methodologies. Mm -hmm. and it would also have to do with quantities and sizes, well, too. Well, quantities we and sizes, earlier. yeah. I mean, if you are doing that, if you're just going to be doing one, let's say it's it's your children and you want to have a large print, uh, you know, in the living room. Well, what mm -hmm. what look do you, do you like? Mm -hmm. Is there any that, like... Are known to serve better for skin tones necessarily. And well, again, I know it, it can be yeah, I, 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 I would just say this. I mean, photographic paper mm -hmm. was designed for skin tones. Most pictures are of people, so you can get marvelous, marvelous flesh tones photographically. Uh, certainly, when it comes to uh, abstract colors, I mean, inkjet overall has a much wider gambit. Abstract colors, certainly, you know, in terms in terms of that. The big advantage of a, of a C print is that if a file is not as good as it should be, not as large as it should be, a C print is much more forgiving. It will not show artifacts as readily. It will not show defects. It will not pixelate. Uh, as readily because it's being printed at a lower resolution in most cases. Um, the, so at the same time, it won't show the killer detail you're going to get from well, your average you desktop can, printer. Well, you can <laughs> because you're, you're, it depends on the type of enlargers and the technology. You're, you're, you know, when you get into DPI, a lot of these things are very misleading because a lot depends on the methodology that's, that's utilized. It's really what your eyes see. Mm -hmm. that's, that's it's perceptual. Really, it, ex exactly. But the thing is you do have new larges out that will print at very, very high resolutions. I mean, you could, uh, the detail is, is, is microscopic. Okay. I mean, and what you could see. So, I mean, that's not really an issue. I, I mean, it comes down to how it's being seen, the, v the view, the life you might need, the environment. Right. I mean, Do you have as many options on paper when you're doing a digital C print? You don't have as many options I nearly so, as yeah. you do. I mean, basically, it comes down to a matte gloss, matte glossy, yeah. uh, flex, tran, if something is backlit. Inkjet, you have hundreds. I mean, the one thing that I find a little crazy, though, is so many times uh, someone in a store could be showing you the paper, feel the paper. Once you make a print, you don't want to touch it. 
That's true. You know, you don't want to get But there is something a, wonderful about handling yeah. a fine art print. Yeah. No two ways about it. Yeah, they're, 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 the tactile experience is great. You don't get that on a yeah. screen. What about the, the, the dice, <clears throat> dye sublimation machines and prints? I, I mean, I know that, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but that's more for a volume, high volume, and it's... It's a process where you have it's, ribbons of color that are then heated onto the yeah, paper. Yeah, it's 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 a different look. When uh, in the eighties, I mean, dye sublimation were we were very big for for a while. A beautiful look. There was size limitations. Then inkjet came out and kind of pushed it aside. Mm -hmm. But now with different um, technologies, people wanting to have things printed on wood or metal. The fact that. Uh, over the years, you know, with even with inkjet, you were able to uh, print onto metal, but if you got in a humid environment, literally everything would kind of fall off. Now with dye sublimation, because there's all this molecular transfer, you have a greater permanence and archivalness, oh, really? a toughness uh -huh. to, to uh -huh. things. And this is something that's changing almost every day. Um, what I used to find exciting was we would do things for department stores, you know, uh, rollouts, new products, and they want something new and different, latest technology. Photographer would see it, he'd like to do it. And I'd say, but, you know, the problem is we have no idea how, the, how long this is going to last. It might literally fade out or it might literally, because some of these methods, again, are so new. Mm. So it, it's... Well, uh, I know they have these things now. I mean, it was my understanding or my thought that Dysub was kind of on, on the way out, mm. but I know that even they're making these miniature uh, Polaroid zip printers yep. that mm -hmm. I think it's the same technology, right? So yeah. there's a couple of points about dye sublimations. There's a couple of factors. Now, we do have like the Canon selfie for family members who want to do picnics and get togethers. Selfie does four by six prints. Now, these units are pretty slow now compared to uh, DNP, Mitsubishi's, Fujifilm dye sublimation units, you print them out in seconds. So right. you could print them out in those are 13 like those, seconds. They're like an oven, like those bagel machines that so, just pour them out, right? Right, <laughs> yeah. right, right. So, so basically, yeah. <laughs> so ideally, those are built for event photographers. Right. Event photographers who do weddings, party occasions, get-togethers, clubs. Fast you know, turnaround. Oh, so it's yeah. cost convenient. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could get like from one of the units that we sell a lot and, and the DMPs, like you could get 804 by six for a hundred bucks. I mean, right there is a bargain. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. sell them right there on the spot. The photographer is making a profit. You don't have to deal with maintenance like with inkjets, but with dye sublimation, you have two options, glossy or semi-gloss, or they also name it as matte, which is semi-gloss, pearl finish. They use that terminology on it. Which but is what you want for these applications. Right, right. So, but with inkjets, as Jay said, you have um, exploring the options of many fine art matte papers, as well as resin coating papers and fiber-based papers. warm tone, cool. So, and there's a lot of little subtle right, variations right. you can choose from. So it's ideally for those who wanna um, print in their own studios, whether if they wanna give packages, event photographers who wanna give p packages for their clients or albums that they wanna print out, they go towards that approach or exhibition purposes, as I explained earlier on. So Inkjet's ideal for that purpose, for a professional photographer who want to do in-house, sell their work, or exhibit their work, dye sublimation is ideally for event photographers. There's also dye base inkjet printers that are built for consumers who want to print out their photos These are the and entry frames, level entry ones, levels, right. yeah. So, so families who want to surprise their family members or friends right there for dinner occasions or for holidays, instead of going out to the drugstore, printing them out, and you want to surprise them right there. An element of surprise is great to have. You could insert your memory card, flash drive. Now with the innovation of Wi-Fi technology, you could print off of your smartphone and tablet yeah, right there. Wirelessly. I mean, yeah. it's it's amazing. Now, the other element of surprise with dye-based printers is mm -hmm. that within a year, the print can surprise, start fading. Yeah. Now, um, you know, they look good and then they not, go away. Okay, so there's, there's a point with dye-based inkjet printers that it doesn't fade. Now, if there was continuous UV light hitting on the image, That's, yeah. the color will become dull and the, the paper will tend to turn yellowish. Y now, humidity that's another will factor. also affect it. It's right. not only UV right. light, but it's humidity. It's right. a little Moisture, there's, there's a couple of factors there. And um, some people frame it 
I mean, there's times that I've recommended to coat it with fixative, yes. you know, to avoid that. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, um, yeah, it, it, it varies. It varies depending on the consumer or professional of which printer that they will approach and purchase and what they're looking for or what to do. And they go about it that way. And also recommended uh, customers if they are not going to print a lot, if they're going to be on and off. Yes, and the tour print lab. It will be a lot cheaper because if you're not ideal of, of printing your work, if you're not busy in times, then you don't need an inkjet printer, a professional inkjet printer. Because if you're on and off, then you're going to sit there, your inks are going to clog, and then next thing you know, you consumed a lot of ink. It's money. Mm -hmm. It's it's money right there. Um and, and you're going to say to yourself, oh, what did I do? Why did I buy this machine? You know, I should have sent it out to the lab now. I'm going to deal with maintenance. It becomes a wreck for your clothes. So to if the, you pile up your papers on it and everything right, else like that. Right, right. If you're business oriented, if you are an artist or a photographer and you're going to sell your work and you're going to dedicate your time, go for it. Because what we sell, they're great machines from Epson, Canon. Now, HP... Um, it's, it's a hit or miss. I mean, with the Design Jet series, they're great. I see a lot of designers use it, interior designers use it. But when it comes to photography, it's mixed. Certain photo studios still use them, but they still recommend Epson and Canon because of their color accuracy, easily, uh, the easy ability to find the ICC profiles of the papers that they're using for giving them the output that they want. So I would say, yeah, Epson and Canon are in the head market. And for photography, fine art, graphic art, and um, HB Design Jets, I would say, are great for CAD purposes, interior design, exterior design, architectural prints, and um, also I would say that uh, dye sublimation, the event dye sublimation printers from DMP Mitsubishi and um, High Tie, I forgot that name, they're ideal for event photographers to print on the spot. Can I jump back to yeah. uh, a question, and I guess it's, again, more for printing at a lab, mm -hmm. but not necessarily because, you know, I used to always shoot black and white and printing in black and white back 10 years ago was digitally printing anyway. It was almost horrible. useless. Horrible. Let's <laughs> well, just put it that way. Yeah. Everything was green. Was. Everything was blue. Yeah. And I, I used to get magenta. You, you got yeah. green because I used to get magenta. What were you doing wrong? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it seems that that's come a long way with the black and white. So, right. And right. that's, can you print digital C prints? Uh, in black and white, and expect you, them to be good. I th I th one of the big problems I think early on with the, the and when when the prints we're talking about, mm -hmm. the earliest issues that most manufacturers had with the earlier printers was that they were four or six color ink sets, and there was one black, and it was right. really the it was an opaque black that was really meant for printing text. They said, okay, but we'll mix you in with a little bit of red, blue, green, and everything else, and you'll make gray. Never did, and the black and white printing first became better when Epson started doing two and then three yeah. shades of black, yeah, or yeah. what they call black, light black, and right. light, light black. Right. Right. <laughs> okay. Photographically, um, you can certainly get gorgeous black and white prints on color paper, without a doubt. Uh, the only issue is, you know, the paper itself is basically, you know, a resin-coated type material. You do have black and white specific paper. Initially, it was a resin-coated paper, but now you actually have fiber-based paper. So it's just like old papers you've seen, the same feel to it. You can get beautiful, beautiful quality. Uh, and then the, the beautiful thing is if you want to, again, take your file and maybe mimic a platinum print, uh, sepia, whatever, you can do all that. And you have great, great control. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. the one thing Are I- Are you just I, talking about inkjet right I'm, now? No, photographic. Okay. Because yeah. the one thing that I, I found was that photographically speaking, the fact that you're using computers and software to control everything, you have a greater precision mm -hmm. compared to the inkjet. Right. Sometimes I found with inkjet, you make a minor change, you really can't see it especially if you're using a texture paper, because is, is the ink kind of hitting the peak or the valley? It could change the look. Photographic, remember the, the material is produced in the dark. There's much more precision. Uh, the same way paper-wise with inkjet overall, I've seen rolls of paper where it's different from the beginning to the end. Right, right, right. 
you, know, you, you also have a thing if you're making adjustments, your, your, your judgment is based on what you're seeing, electronic light on a screen. Mm -hmm. And those transitions are different from what the ink is going to do sure. on the media. Sure. So it's a little bit of give and take on each side there. Yeah. So basically, I remember like back in 2002 when I was with Epson, and I remember with the 2200, when that unit came out, there were a lot of back orders because people want to do professional black and white output. Like people who were in dark room and they wanted that black and white output to be printed digitally, I would see people like line up for this machine. And I said to myself, all right, this is a great machine, but is it a big difference? Now, I had a couple of photography buddies who did their black and white prints in the dark room. When I put it side by side, I said, there's still something missing. And then sure enough, a couple of years later when they uh, when Epson released the R2400, yeah. Yeah, they added <laughs> those two extra grays and then I was like, all right, they're selling more inks, but is there going to be a big difference? And oh, boom, right yes. there. I did not see on the cool grays, the tinta cyan, the warm grays, tinta magenta, the neutral grays, tinta greens, it made a big difference. And now Canon had to step up the game. And uh, later on, they released their model, and it's head to head right now with, with Canon and Epson. They're competing back and forth with the black and white prints. And uh, before, Canon couldn't get that accuracy, the flesh tones, the pigmentation of the flesh tones. Like years back, when you did a color print and you had this pigmentation uh, that was leaning towards orange, like uh, like my pigmentation would be orange. And, and then the blacks were as, as deep, as rich as the Epsons. And now they're head to head. It's, it's amazing. And right now, could I say that they're doing great with black and whites? Yes. But are there critical photographers who say it's not there yet? Well, there are options. Like, for example, John Combs came up with an innovating idea of creating his piezography inks, which you um, change the color inks and put grayscale ink cartridges. Mm -hmm. So if you're a critical photographer and you want the best outcome of black and whites, people have used their inks. I've checked it out. It's it's outstanding. Yeah, I've used it's, it. It's yep. amazing. Definitely. I mean, people who are looking into black and white photography and don't want to deal with chemicals in their <laughs> bathtub or, <laughs> yeah. or in their own room that they created or, and deal with those hazardous materials, boom, you can have your printer right there, print out your black and whites and any media type and have outstanding results. You can swap out the inks. Mm -hmm to any, any color combination you want or any black and gray combination you so want. So basically you swap out all the colorings. Right, and put in different and, shades. And yeah. put those shades of gray in okay. there. And um, and then you can get each channel you could play around. Each channel. With, which well, is nice. the catch with that is that if you want to swap out and that, use color yeah. again, oh boy, be prepared for flushing ink out. Be, uh, be prepared yeah. to just buy a second printer and yeah, don't right. bother doing that. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> true. You're right. You're We're right. going to take a short break and come back with more chit-chat on printers and paper. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. We are back. Uh, Sam, can you tell us a little bit about what's available right now for enthusiasts and people who are real serious about making prints? Well, it all depends on category. So, okay. so basically, um, uh, there's consumer, semi-professional, professional. Consumer level is the category of people who want to print their occasional photo prints to give to family and friends and maybe uh, prepare their for portfolio depending on their size. Like our best sellers have been the Epson Expression lines uh, with their five color and six color base units where it's ideally uh, great for color photographers. Uh, photographers are dealing with color gamut. Uh, they want the best output um, as possible and the convenience of inserting their memory card, flash drive, external hard drive or camera directly and printing out their photos. So we look at... Uh, the, the consumer who was interested into convenience as well as getting to learn into photography, digital photography, we offer them the Epson Expression line, Canon Pixma line, letter size formats, and their semi-professional 13-inch wide format Canon Pro 100 and so the Epson 1430. What general price range for the, the consumer ones? are in the, the consumer levels range around $80 to $160. 
uh, for the 13-inch wide format, the semi-professional again, like the Canon Pro 100 and the uh, Epson 1430, around $280, $300. So they're all very range. affordable. Very affordable, convenient. Are, yep. there, are there any four-color printers that are capable of doing really, really not amazingly good, but very acceptable, acceptable. color prints? Well, or right, should people really avoid those if that's what you really want to well, do? Well, the four-color base units are common on HP Office Jet and the Epson Workforce. The, those units we recommend for office workflow. Now, you gotcha. could print graphic images and photographs. But you're not going to frame as, them and go ooh-ah over It's them. not rich. It yeah. comes out flat. Yeah. So it's not as vibrant and rich. And I imagine it's a lot of little subtle color. tones that you just don't get. Yeah, you're going to get those inaccuracies. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. So six color is the bottom line that you really want to be looking that's at. Like, is that safe to say? Yeah, that's to start off. Okay. I would recommend for that for consumers. Correct. Uh, where they won't be disappointed at all. Mm -hmm. They'll be happy with the results. Now, going in with the semi-professional, there are the 13-inch wide formats like the P400, P600 Epson models, as well as the Canon Pro 10 and Pro 1 models. Now, they range in 8, 9, and 12 inks. Now, the 8 and 9 inks are on the Epson lines, which is the P400, which is the 8-color line. Great for color gamut. Great for color photography, fine art, graphic art, which it could handle thicker card stock media up to 400 GSM, meaning that means that you could print on fine art cotton rag paper as well as canvas, mm -hmm. uh, which is outstanding to have a unit that costs around $600 to have a unit to print on fine art matte media and get pigmented base inks out of it, you can't beat that. Can you blend, can you use one inks from one manufacturer with another printer? Are you talking about third party inks? Um, no, you, if you're asking, okay, can you yes, put Canon print, yeah. can yeah. you put Canon ink in an Epson printer? That's no. what I'm asking. No, that you can't do. <laughs> That's no possibility. <laughs> They're laughing you know, at the me. manufacturer <laughs> will say, you know, uh, hey, uh, I think you've ruined the warranty. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, right away. <laughs> and third-party inks, are they anything out there worthwhile? All right, so third-party inks. Ugh, that well, used to be a big thing, I remember, but I haven't following them lately. Is, is anybody doing that anymore? People stress out on the cost of ink, and they f try to find out uh, if there's a cheaper way to print. And I could understand. It's not it's not reasonably priced. It adds up when you're printing, but you know if you're selling your work and you're – Putting your portfolio out there and you want to represent your work and you want the genuine quality of it, I would recommend using genuine inks because the downside of third-party inks, there's a couple of factors. Uh, colors are going to be off and then you're going to wait there and edit your, your images and create your own custom profiles. And then another factor is that it could uh, corrupt your chipset. Mm -hmm. Those ink cartridges have chips, and the printhead has chip readers. So basically, that could void the warranty of the printer, or boom, if you have a deadline to do your work, and you're stuck in the middle of a project, uh-oh. They're also pretty rush cumbersome, out and get another one. a lot of those systems. I, I remember I, want, I once converted an Epson printer to a third-party large mm -hmm. bulk system. And it, Continuous when I, ink system, CIS. Yeah, 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 and yeah, I, yeah. I walk in, I look, it looked like a printer on life support. <laughs> it really, it, it had everything except that little boop, boop. Boop, that, that was it. Yeah. Uh, but it, and it really was not worth it at the end. Not at all worth the time I mean, and effort. Yeah, the there, amount of materials. There's are a trashed. hit or miss. Yeah. yeah, you'll be surprised. It works, and then there's a time that you're like kaput. Yeah, yeah. So um, back to this question: Is it the inks that aren't compatible, or the cartridges and the systems themselves? Yes, both. <laughs> <laughs> the inks just they don't match. Like from um, one company to the other. The inks yeah. could be a problem because it, 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 some heads are, are, it depends on the size of the uh, of the dot size. And now mm -hmm. if the ink is thicker or heavier uh, volume, yeah. whatever, viscosity, right. it could, I don't know, do so all kinds I, of stuff. However the manufacturer built these units, it's it's customized for those, it's those a ink system. cartridges. Yeah, it's a system to give you that output, yeah. Yeah, also the little bit I know, you're using different methodologies in your printers, mm -hmm. in other words, how the print the ink is put down on the paper. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. yes. So what might work in mm -hmm. one might not work in the Correct. other. Mm -hmm. Correct. So. Correct. You're okay. absolutely right. Yeah. And they're priced similarly anyway, so it's not really right. an issue. What is thermal inkjet? Is there something that is that just a marketing well, the thing, is, thing? Or is I mean, thermal like? when it comes to thermal. So so, Canon has been using the thermal inkjet printers for years. So mm -hmm. what that is, is that um. 
it heats up the print print head okay. to lay out the ink. While Epson has been using the micropesia technology, which sends out electrical impulses to pressure out the ink to lay it out. So the reason why Canon wanted to stick with thermal technology was that um, they wanted to avoid clogging heads. Mm -hmm. So if there's a period of certain weeks when you're not using the printer the or when the machine is on, the heads won't be clogged. Now, any inkjet could clog if it's a period of months right. if you're away. You're going to run through cleaning cycles. But yeah, so thermal technology like the inkjet ther thermal technology Canon has been using while Epson has been using their micropesia technology for over 20 also, years. Yeah. Also, you yeah, have, yeah. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Canon has much more, many more heads. Right, that's correct. And then Epson. Nozzles, yeah. Yeah, the nozzles. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they're different technologies. And, right. Right. You know, so. And then there's the P600 and the Canon Pro 1, which now the 600 has nine inks and the Pro 1 has 12 inks. Now they use larger capacity ink levels. Now that was a detail I missed out to, to let the people know about this. Now, if you're doing quantity of prints, now the Epson P600 has 25.9 milliliter inks, while the Pro 1 has 30 or 32 milliliter inks. Um, now, compared to the consumer level models and the semi-professional like the P400 and the Canon Pro 100, they have 14 milliliter inks. Now, if you're doing a lot of printing, it's going to be cost efficient on the P600 and the Pro 1 model. And another nice factor about these models is that they do have the grayscale ink cartridges. So if your photographer is interested into black and white photography, it's the best approach to go with those units. Because if you tend to do black and white photography on those other printers, you're going to see color casting. And now these units yes. are, yeah. what? what's the, the, the name of the line? I mean, there's Pixma, there's ProGraph. Uh, right. And which ones are these? So the... Pixma models are mm -hmm. the Pro 100, Pro 10, Pro 1, and the Image ProGraph models are the Canon Pro 1000, 2000 models, and um, the the 4000 models. And we're so, talking about we're talking so those go up from to... the 17, 24. So they have their compact 17 inch wide format that competes with the Epson P800, um, but then it jumps up to large scale plotters so mm -hmm. 24 and 44 inch wide and we're formats. talking thousands of dollars so basically here. yeah so the pro 1000 is for around 1300 and the uh, epson p800 is around 1200 dollars and they have great offers right now with their mail-in rebates to make it convenient for those uh, interested in buying those units. Great offers, great offers right now. And the uh, 24 and 44 inch wide formats range around $2,600, $3,000. I mean, you're, you're more than welcome to check it out on our website because prices do change. Um, if you were to look at what it costs to become an inkjet printer or a right. digital printer, right. In the earlier days, they what they had what they were called Giclée printers. Which oh. Giclée, of course, is French for to blow, <laughs> which is really inkjet printer, uh, but yeah. it was fancier. And and they stuck to that name because these machines cost like over a hundred thousand dollars at the time. It's amazing, isn't it? And now wow. you can buy the equivalent of that for yeah. two grand. It's it's amazing. It's and, and amazing. I also once did the. Uh, a friend of mine did the math on just the, if you want to talk about right. what's worth it if you're going to be doing some uh, serious printing mm -hmm. with the smaller printers with the tiny cartridges. A friend of mine some mm -hmm. years ago did the math of how much it would cost if you had a six color printer, which is the average consumer printer, and he wanted to fill up six one gallon jugs with each of the colors. So you'd have mm -hmm. six gallons of each color. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody want to take a guess how much it would cost at retail for the cartridges to fill up? Each color into a one gallon jar. Yeah. Any takers? Oh, yeah, the gross national product of <laughs> Costa Rica. Yes, it's close. It was about it was it was just under ten thousand oh, dollars for six gallons of this ink. This is wow. when? This goes back about 10, 15 years ago. And I don't think it's changed much because you pay a lot for those. But the point is, is that if you're gonna be doing some serious printing and you want to do yeah. this regularly, you yeah. buy a printer with larger capacity uh, 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 ink cartridges. Right. And now you could start printing economically. And when you go to the larger printers, these 24-inch, 44-inch printers, right. which will cost you two or $3,000, mm -hmm. okay? But the difference is that you can now print on the highest quality fine art paper with mm -hmm. the finest quality inks for about $6 a square foot. So if you're printing 
right. for it to sell prints. Think about that. Exactly. I mean, I had somebody who told me, you're not printing yeah, photographs, yeah. you're printing money. Yeah. Another thing is, is paper because you only have a very small number of companies that actually produce paper. Right. Many times paper is sold, repackaged, mm -hmm. and obviously marked up. So um, it's something people should check on and know the paper they're using and what the alternatives are for the same paper, a different name. I could think be a lot we cheaper. have, I haven't checked it, but yeah. my guess is we have probably over 30 brands of inkjet paper mm -hmm. at yeah, B&H. And I think yeah. there are only four paper mills on the planet that make Correct. all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So Sam, let me, let me <laughs> jump back to some of the things that people should be looking for. All right. Um, your specs, mm -hmm. you have your resolution for printers. Right. Print area, print speed. Mm -hmm. Number of inks, obviously, right. interface options. Can you talk about... Uh, so basically numbers, yes. Yeah. Numbers, dots per inch, resolution. You know, throughout the years, uh, I've seen resolution where Epson was uh, 1440 by 720. I remember on the 1280. That was oh, mine. That, I, had, yeah. I had the 870. Wow, and so. the 872. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It that was the letter size minutes. version of yes, it. Yes, yeah, it yeah. took 12 minutes to make a so-so print. That's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it took a lot so, of time so. to print, yeah, and, and it, people would and say it faded it's within slow. three months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were you hitting it directly on sunlight? <laughs> <laughs> the refrigerator door, that was it. Six months, okay. it was gone. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're looking at resolution that is 5,760 by 1440, or we're looking at Canon resolution, which is 4,800 by 2,400 DPI. Honestly- Can you see the difference between, say, the only past way 28 uh, you know, it's all, I think it's marketing strategy. When people see larger numbers, they go, whoa, blown away. You know, it's just like how megapixels with digital cameras. But, you know, there's other form factors like, you know, the sensor. You look at the sensor, that also matters. Don't forget about the sensor now. It's not only the numbers of the megapixel. So with dots per inch, yeah, I mean, it's an improvement. But are you going to notice that with the naked eye? No way. Unless if you have a microscope, you're going to notice those dots per inch right there. The other key factor is the pickle eater. The pickle eater is the droplet size where the ink is laid out from the printhead to the paper. So, yeah, I remember when years back, 15, 20 years ago, it was six pickle eaters and then four. Now, now we're, we're at two and two, two and, and 1.5 yeah. pickle eaters, two on the Epson, 1.5 on the Canons. Yeah, they've improved a lot, um, but again, it's um, dependent on color gamut. Color gamut, the ink cartridges, the grayscale of the grayscale ink cartridges, uh, archival inks, the pigmented base inks, those are crucial for people selling their work or um, exhibiting their work. Uh, that's the recommendation. And and when, when people ask for a DPI, are they going to look at it? Yeah. I mean, you could look at your print close up to your face. You're not going to notice those dots per inch right there. And that's important. And, and right. one, by the way, I think a key marketing thing, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why the manufacturers like pushing these high numbers yeah. is that if you want to print it's competition. at that highest, right. okay, just keep one thing in mind, you're throwing more ink mm -hmm. on the paper. Yeah, if you set the quality on a higher setting, uh -huh. yes, you are laying out more ink. It will consume. You're draining ink those cartridges quicker, and they love you for that. Hey, <laughs> if your project matters, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, <laughs> but for average use, though, you don't have to. You don't have no, to. No, no, go no. flat out for DPI. I mean, if someone was printing contact sheets, uh, you could print that in standard quality just to get an idea, sure. or some some sort of presentation to get an understanding of what's going to be printed out there on the media just to evaluate it. And then if you're prepared to finalize that project, yeah, set it on the highest quality. Can I give you an yeah. example? I'm going to be printing uh, uh, prints for a small show in a month or so, 16 by 20 prints, okay. color photos. All right. And I want them to look as good as, as possible right. uh, on a nice stock. Mm -hmm. um, what what printer would I buy for this? And and let's say going forward, I'll do many of these. And, and I'm not necessarily concerned about you know, weighing the options of there how are often good choices use it. for 16, 20. But, but what would yeah. what would be a good option for, let's say, how often do you do your exhibits? You know, right, let's. That's a good question. He's but, getting real famous now from this but, podcast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it depends on your let, workflow. Yeah, that, that's a good point. But let's yeah. just say, like, kind of ignoring that for a second. Okay. What what printer from each company would provide me something that would be a, that two kind main of manufacturers, right. mm -hmm. Canon and Epson? All yeah. Right. And the what P eight hundred? Uh huh. Epson. And uh, Canon ImageCraft Pro 1000. And those are ballpark what price? Um, around $1,200 for the P800 and 1300 for the Canon 
ImageCraft Pro 1000. They both use 80 milliliter inks, so they're going to be very cost efficient in the long run when you're printing a lot. And um, now 16 by 20, you know, it's funny with digital printers and papers, they come in very odd With sizes, sizes yeah. like because from a 13 by 19 pre-cut it jumps to a 17 by 22 now mm -hmm. you could lay out your 16 by 20 there and get a trimmer and cut, cut it out it, yourself right. um but i've never seen 16 by 20 digital inkjet papers out mm -hmm. there in the market which what about it roll is common. paper now a lot of well, these printers now all that's another right. thing right now you come to the size right now you could start using roll papers okay. and i believe there are 16 inch rolls i might yeah, be wrong is. about that epson does yep. have 16 inch okay. rolls like uh, it's common on their luster media brand but then epson is also specific with their paper type and sizes now even he wants to do a 16 by 20 and mm -hmm. he's not happy with luster and he wants to go with a different paper texture they're all going to be 17 inch. So prepare mm -hmm. yourself right, for right. trimming and cutting. And this to comparatively, I, you know, I, I, looking at labs that I've, spo mm -hmm. I've spoken to, the same thing mm -hmm. for an inkjet print mm -hmm. of tier one. And again, this is another issue, tier one, tier two, all these different right. options I give you. That's going to be about 50 to $70 for a mm -hmm. 16 by 20 print. And I'm going to do 20, mm -hmm. uh, 50 and 20. You know, there's I'll a, tell you this. You can get a pack up. of 25 of 17 by 22 for $50. Mm-hmm. Okay. You do the math. That's right. that's pretty darn reasonable. Mm -hmm. And of course, obviously, now the inks are eighty the milliliters. Doing. They're mm -hmm. fifty four ninety five a pop. Now the Canon has twelve inks. The Epson is uh, nine inks. Um, now, yeah, three extra inks on the Canon ImageCraft Pro one thousand. They've included a blue and a red to match the Adobe RGB color spectrum to give you a wider color gamut. Um, and uh, the Chroma Optimizer. What does that do? Well. You heard the term bronzing, right? Oh, yeah. When you do your digital prints. Let's say you got sky blues with white clouds. What happens to the white clouds? Well, it's mixing with the opacity setting of the, the brightness of the paper. So it's not going to print. So it's going to leave it blank. So, so if you're you printing it, glossy ink on flat, on matte paper, you have shine and dull. Well, mostly on resin-coated paper. Yes. Because when you angle it on the light, you could see that area was imprinted when you angle it. So what the Chroma Optimizer does, which Canon is smart doing this because it overlays it with a gloss coating. So it blends in and balances in with the other color prints, like with the sky blues, with that white cloud. Now it blends in with that, uh, that, that, that coating of the mm -hmm. glossy mm -hmm. Chroma Optimizer. So it's key that they did that. And um, so the important factor is that you're paying for three extra inks compared to the Epson. Now you're gonna think to yourself, so what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? Well, if you're color gamut oriented, you're very critical in color, then go with the Gamut Image Pro, Graph one, uh, Pro 1000. But um, if you're not too critical and you say that, okay, this could work for me, I'm happy with it, I'm satisfied with it, you could go with the P800, it still produces great color gamut, because the only differences that I've seen personally with my colleagues in the Superstore is that there was, the blues were slightly better on the Canon and there was slight contrast difference. Uh, black and whites were pretty much identical. You're not gonna tell the difference, but, but there's a catch with the Canon. You can't do panoramics. So uh, the P800 has the capability of doing panoramic printing. I think what, up to 44 inches? 131 inches. I stand corrected. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you could do it. Now Canon <laughs> did, release a firm well supposedly that's what the vendor told me that they were going to release a firmware update to do 53 inches in length on the image pro graph um and thicker cardstock so they both handle up to 400 gsm canvas cotton rag fine art matte media but the epson has a front loading system where you can load poster board map board thickness as thick as 1.5 or 1.2 millimeter cardstock which the Canon does not do. So you got like these ups and downs. So, uh, you know, By the way, if you're printing the, for a show, that's an important thing yeah, because yeah, yeah. this cardstock that Sam just mentioned, it's like printing a dry mounted print. Right. Mm. And it comes in 1620. So you can actually print that's, images that's ready correct. to be popped Absolutely. into a frame. Into a frame. Yeah, Absolutely. Makes a difference. Yeah. That's awesome. Let's jump up to the high end. I mean, what is out there? What's available? And, uh, 
Is there any reason why a, a, your regular photographer would want to go that? Well, you way? got the space, go for it. Yeah. That's important. They're not yeah. any more difficult to use than the, the, the smallest no, desktops. No. The menus are no. identical. Pretty mm-hmm. much similar. The procedure's pretty much the same. Pretty much similar. You're going to get the same principle of the printer property settings as the 17-inch wide formats. But uh, yeah, the main difference is, is larger prints. Um, and larger drawers to store them in. Bigger walls or bigger home to hang it. them on. Tell me about it. If you got a big <laughs> studio, <laughs> go for it. Otherwise, that's going to take up your one bedroom apartment. I'm telling you right now because they're big. I'm going to tell, I'm gonna tell you another thing. Okay, if I've had large format printers, okay. They're like crack. They were. They, they are so <laughs> addicting. I'm telling you, you could just stay up all night long printing because it's so awesome to take your pictures, especially when you really like, and print it out huge. And you hold it up and you stick it on the wall yeah. and you're just in there going, <gasps> and yeah, you go back and make more. And before you know it, there's no food. It there's is, no money for rent or food. It is addicting. Yeah, <laughs> it is. it's it's addicting when you're focused on projects and. Yeah. Uh, putting the time and effort on it. I was printing pictures of food just to, just to be able to live. <laughs> <laughs> so if like money aside uh, or budget aside, what would you, uh, what would you buy if, if money and space in your apartment, your room, your lab aside? So it really depends on the criteria of what the person is going to use it for. So if this person wants a nice 24 by 30 or 24 by 36 print sizes, yeah, they're going to go with the 24 inch wide format. They're going to make space for it. But again, Now, there's ink factors with these units, but you have three options. What's great about these units? With the Canon and the Epsons, you have 150 milliliter inks, 350, and 700. Now, what does that mean? That means that if you are on and off printing and you have exhibits that come up like maybe a month or two or six months throughout the year, I would go with the 150 milliliters. Now, if you're going to have during that month period where you're busy, on and off for the one or two weeks, and then busy again, I would go with the 350. Now, if you're a print lab and you're doing a lot of prints for people or for clients, or this is your job, you want to do prints for your clients, go with the 700 milliliters. The reason why is is cost per print. You don't want those inks. If you get a 700 milliliter or 350 milliliter ink cartridge, you don't want that to be sitting there if you're going to be on and off Mm -hmm. because you're Mm -hmm. going to be wasting so much money spending so much money it's it's unbelievable because the 150s cost around 89.95 the 350s are $140 and then the 700 milliliters cost around 300 350 so so no i'm sorry incorrect uh, 240 240 dollars so again Prices could change depending on the manufacturer, but these are the prices that we have. And what printer models at that level? Now, these are the Epson Short Color P7000 and the um, Image Pro Graph Short Color P2000. Yeah, yeah. And those are the 24 inch? 24 inch wide okay. formats. Yeah. And then we have the 44 inch wide formats like the P9000 and the Image Pro Graph 4000 models. They're beasts. And if you're primarily a black and white printer, shooter, is there one model that you would recommend you over another? You could do black and white, color, you name it. You could do anything with these units. They're outstanding. They're amazing units. I got my little first Epson printer in 1999, so we've come a long way since mm-hmm. then, so have I. Um, what would you want to see right now? What are the printers not doing that you wish they did? Wow. capable of? Because it seems to me we've come just phenomenal way well let's see in the future if they make large format printers that are slightly smaller in design that's one option um next approach i don't know how they're going to evaluate with laser technology are they going to take a different approach with laser printers and compete with uh longevity and um Archival inks, well, with the pigmented base inks, they're 100, you, 200 you years, might but have let's see what happens. Emerging maybe of 3D, being able to print products with images on it or text. Um, I think it's whatever the designers can come up with. Just you guys if are, 3D are, printing will ever merge with 2D printing like Epson. And have you heard any of that? Are Epson or Canon playing with any of this stuff? Not right that now? I know of. I mean, Epson yeah, has right. could be always dealt with, you know, starting off with dot matrix inkjets. They never got into or been interested with laser technology. 
Um, but otherwise, Jay's right. I mean, uh, why not? Three-dimensional printing, holographic printing, uh, printing on gold or silver layouts, you know. But like in terms on, of the quality for your regular photographer, objects, yeah. I mean, again, going back 10 years even, mm -hmm. The, you know, the digital printing, the, the quality wasn't there. I mean, I, I right. never found that I would want to show a lot of the work. Uh, you have no reservations now. We're, we're kind of there in terms of digital printing being the equal of chemical photographic I mean, think printing. about it. Back in 2002, it was six or seven inks. Now we're up to 11 to 12 inks, 11 on the Epson, 12 on the Canon. And inkjet printing has long been accepted by galleries and museums yeah. mm -hmm. for the yeah. longest time now. It, it early has. on, there was a everybody was kind of looking at it with a cocked eye, but yeah, no longer. It's, it's, it's the You're norm. It's accepted right. and, yeah. and in many ways preferable. It's, mm -hmm. it's more, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. It's certainly more archival than conventional photographic Absolutely. prints. Let's see. Only Absolutely. the future will tell. Let's see what happens. We'll, what will be next? That will be eye candy for, for the consumer or professional. One fast little word I'm going to throw in before I ask Jay a final question. And as we, t we talk a lot about permanence, and I think it's important to keep in mind that if you buy a basic printer, and even the most entry-level printers uh, under average viewing storage conditions – the prints will last 10, 20 years. I think 25 years is no longer a big stretch right now for a lot of inkjet. Not at all. Well, Wilhelm Research has done the math and the timing with uh, UV lighting, humidity, moisture with the Epson and Canons. And they've came up with numbers to 100 to 200 years. Now, people are going to say, how did the researchers come up with those numbers? Well, they uh, they timed it out by doing math and how much density of UV lighting they do and moisture. They do heat, humidity. To, they, to, yeah, they accelerate all Yeah, they stuff. accelerate it all to, to evaluate that, that, that timing, you know. But that, the point is, and what they're talking about is when they give these numbers, it's under ideal storage. Right. No heavy doses of UV light, low mm -hmm. humidity, cool temperatures. So the point is You're that right. if you take that 25-year print, mm -hmm. okay, and you hang it in your home or office, and it's away from windows, away from fluorescent lamps or any UV light source, right. and it's comfortable and cool and not damp, it that print could outlast – Another print made on a printer that guarantees 200 years, but the mm -hmm. print is hanging at your beach house in front of that bay window mm -hmm. facing south and the water. Guess what? It's going to be blasted away in 10 years. Yeah. So it's a lot that has to do with you know where and how and everything else. Code it. That's you it. You could code it with fixative or if you print it on canvas, varnish. Yeah. We have those options as well. To to help the photographer, fine art enthusiast as well. You yeah. know, or UV glass. Or that too. Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. Bingo. <laughs> Jay, one last question for yeah. you. You've handled some pretty interesting projects over the years. Could you give us an example of one of the more challenging uh, uh, projects you had to deal with as far as, uh, uh, say, inkjet printing or any of the other processes yeah, as the far one, as size, whatever uh, else? Well, the one that comes to mind, I, I think, which uh, probably also the most proud of being involved with was uh, – uh, with Joel Meyerowitz, mm -hmm. the w one year anniversary of 9 11. Uh, it was at 195 Broadway, uh, and it was images he had taken called the aftermath, you know, of, of uh, that day. Uh, it was a huge space, uh, marble floors and walls. The designers uh, came up with a beautiful layout of approximately maybe. 80 or so images, but very large sizes. They wanted things in a huge scale. Um, and it, it was one thing from a production standpoint, but what we had to take into consideration how things were going to be hung, mounted. So with Inkjet, the fact that we could do things, panorama, we could do things on fabric. Mm -hmm. And fabrics could be then done extremely large and then using stretch frames. So we were able to accomplish, you know, very large sizes. I mean, things that might have been, uh, say, you know, 15 feet by 30 feet in one piece. And so you had things that really had an incredible dynamic I impact, but yet you were still having an incredible detail, uh, dynamic range of the image. Now, the when sharpness. you're doing something that, that size, do you, will you, did you have to do multiple copies and to get it right, well, or did you? Uh, well, you're doing that? a lot of testing, certainly. Yeah. Mm. But the you know advantage, I mean, today, obviously, with everything being computer controlled, mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, you're doing your test, you're making, saying, okay, fine, 5% more here, there, printing it. Uh, we'd look at things critical if we had to reprint it to make sure it was perfect. You know, it, it was done because this was just an incredibly important show yeah, because yeah. of the nature of the subject and the timing and so forth. But it, it always stood out to me because just the, the space being just gigantic, you know, incredibly high ceilings, the space, the light and, uh, you know, the magnitude of everything. But at the same token, I mean, I've been involved with projects, you know, literally wrapping buildings. And uh, the advantage, and again, you can say, I guess this is under the inkjet premise, is doing things on fabric, mm -hmm. where, you know, large billboards, eventually all this will be electronic. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. an area that's that's changing. The same way now, even with images, I mean, some people at home, in their homes, they have, a you know, an electronic mm. uh, set up, and they just put the file in, and there's their image. They want to change it. So technology will constantly innovate because the same way with future printers, Canon, Epson, I'm sure they're working on faster, higher resolution, uh, the amount of ink that's being used, you know, how to make it uh, more well, cost effective. Go exactly, going forward, they may so, want to so, uh, be more efficient. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, you know, there's constant progress that, that you know, will, will drive anything. And I think uh, in a couple of years, uh, things we haven't even thought about will be commonplace. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Um, that's a wrap on another fine show. At least I think it was a fine one. Um, join us in a few weeks when we'll do a follow-up episode specifically on photo paper for digital printing. Have any thoughts, suggestions, or comments? Please email us at podast at bhphoto.com. Thank you, Sam. Thank, Thank you. you, Jay, Thank for you. joining You're us welcome. today. Thank you. Thank you, John Thank you. and Jason. On behalf of John, Jason, and myself, Thank you so much for tuning in today. <laughs>